I think they're going to have to reset or succumb, basically. There's just going to be changes that people have to have to take on. I'm Danny Vallant, and this is Dirty Linen, the podcast that takes the issues the hospitality industry finds hard to air in public and shakes them all about. This week on Dirty Linen, we're talking about hospitality business models. What works, what doesn't, what's harder than it used to be, and how can COVID be an opportunity to do things differently for the better? We're starting the week with a veteran chef from Tasmania. Steve Kumper has been cooking since the 1980s. He's done fine dining in Australia and Europe, and he was part of the rise of produce-focused destination dining while working with Maggie Beer. He's been an owner, employee, and advisor. He's always got an interesting take, and he's the perfect person to kick off this week of conversations. Steve, great to have you on Dirty Linen. How are you? I'm great, thanks, Danny. Thanks for inviting me on. You've had a busy day, I hear. Yeah, we're, um, you know, uh, post, uh, well, not post-COVID, but we're extremely busy at the cafe at the moment and getting busier. Uh, So tell me about the cafe. Okay, um, it's called Room for a Pony and it's been... Uh, it's sort of, it's in North Hobart and it's a big indoor outdoor cafe on on a major sort of road uh, in North Hobart and it's been going for about five years and it is getting well it, it's actually a business that's growing and growing with every year um, and I've come on board to help them with their breakfast offering and their cakes. Uh, but later on, I'll be going with one of the partners to open a hotel in North Hobart, just up the road, and that should should happen in a couple of weeks. I mean, it's so great to hear about businesses opening at this time. Um, if I was going to come for brekkie tomorrow, what should I have? Um, well, well, we've got. Uh, it's one of these places that has had a couple of dishes that can't be taken off the menu. One of them is a. Uh, a Chinese um, omelette which has uh, hoisin, chilli, um, fried eggs, um, rice, lots of greens on top and um, people love it, can't take it off the menu. And then we've got, uh, they always have a rosti on in some form or another um, and this time we've got it on with uh, ch- chorizon which is large chorizo, roasted capsicums, um, and a um, smoked paprika uh, hollandaise with almonds, and that's going. You know, we can't keep up, basically. Yeah, they yeah they both sounded excellent, so I might need to yeah head down <laughs> have a two course <laughs> breakfast. Yep, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, so you've been in um, the industry for a couple of years. Can you can you give us an overview? Well, um, started in Melbourne, did my apprenticeship there and then, you know, did what lots of jobbing chefs do. I went overseas for um, three and a half years and I I lived in um, London, Colchester and Paris uh, and worked at, you know, a couple of Michelin star places there. Came back to Australia and um, moved from Melbourne to South Australia and pretty soon, you know, you, you hear about Maggie Beer's Pheasant Farm when you're in South Australia. And at the time, there was a great, um, lots of great country restaurants. And it seemed like um, lots of people in Adelaide particularly would go to country restaurants. Um, it seemed a little bit more um, of a, uh, you know, a normal thing to do. Uh, whereas in Victoria, Melbourne was very Melbourne centric. Um, but anyway, I worked at the pheasant farm and uh, that just really galvanised the approach I wanted to have with my cooking. Prior to that, I was, you know, one of these little white skull cap wearing um, chefs that my um, uh, colleagues rather unkindly called me Mr Europe, you know, because I was so <laughs> so about... Uh, shuffling about the kitchen and we chef and all this sort of malarkey anyway when I was at the pheasant farm it just kind of everything made sense and regionalism back then wasn't really a buzzword but Maggie and a number of other chefs in the Adelaide Hills really made inroads into um, what 
people began to call, I suppose, time and place cooking. Um, and from there, I just really decided long term, I want to work in the country again in some form, but I had to make money. So uh, we moved back to Melbourne and I worked in a number of big restaurants in Melbourne, um, all the while thinking about doing the country thing. And then it came in 2003 after we'd been looking all around Victoria. We looked in the Otways, Castlemaine, Woodend, everywhere that was about, I don't know, maximum two and a half hours from Melbourne. Um, but uh, we ended up going, you know, across the Bass Strait and uh, to Tassie. So we bought a farm uh, which was about uh, an hour and a half south of Hobart and moved into a little village called Signet and um, uh, been there ever so Well, we, we, um, we moved to Signet and uh, I ended up running a restaurant in Signet called the Red Velvet Lounge for eight years uh, until we had a fire and um, never really recovered after that. So now I'm working in Hobart. Okay. It's a long journey. So how, how many years is it since you were an apprentice in Melbourne yet to become Mr Europe? <laughs> um, it was, uh, I started in 82 actually. Okay. So you've seen, you've seen a few ups and downs in the industry. I, I mean, have. I have. So, so this whole pandemic malarkey, if I can borrow your word, um, where, where do you situate it? You know, is this... Is this the biggest and the baddest hiccup that you've seen? Look, I, I think without kind of um, resorting to hyperbole, I, I think it really is because um, I remember when um, uh, back in 87 we had the fringe benefits tax that was um, uh, being uh, discontinued for particularly for restaurants and it was going to be <clears> – <throat> It was going to be disaster apparently for a whole bunch of restaurants. In fact, my old boss, June Sindos and Ray Sindos made all of us go out and protest. <laughs> protest. Wow. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, don't think they could quite get away with it now. But anyway, we did that. Uh, but that was supposed to be the death of all restaurants and it didn't happen. This COVID-19 um, uh, has and will uh, really decimate the industry. Um, there's a lot of people that you know um, or uh, that have related uh, to, you know, their, their businesses have um, had to close. And I think what's highlighted through this um, pandemic is a lot of people actually can, can hear and see that a lot of restaurants were restaurateurs we're living week to week and hand to mouth and that has surprised a lot of people. Will it, um, um, will it really, uh, I don't know, inform them moving forward? I'm not so sure because already we can see people going back to, you know, normal in inverted commas and by normal I mean their expectations as they used to be when they went out. I guess no restaurateur was living week to week because they thought that was just a great way to do things. I mean, people got <laughs> st stuck in that in that treadmill, didn't they? Um, so, yeah. I mean, what could they? Why would this be a reset that allows things allows people to do things differently? Well, um, I, I think they're going to have to um, reset or or. Um, succumb basically there, there's just going to be there's just going to be changes that people have to have to take on um, you know a lot of restaurants that are in the lower um, you know sort of uh, catering to the, the the lower end of the market or the everyday market um, they're I won't say they're insulated from that but they certainly aren't in the crosshairs uh, like the the higher end places, um, those places um, are, are very vulnerable, um, and um, it's also easier for a lot of the lower end or everyday places 
to change their offering to be like we did. We had to rely a lot on takeaway um, for the first few months. It was lucky that uh, at night time the business does uh, slow fermented um, hand-stretched uh, wood-fired pizzas, which, which um, they'd already built a reputation of doing. So that was an easy kind of migration across to, um, to uh, takeaways. And then we implemented a few other um, uh, things on the menu to sort of underpin that offering. And that was enough to keep the business bubbling along combined with improving our takeaway uh, cake options at the coffee counter. So what you're saying, I mean, it's it's all about giving people what they want. Like people love pizza in the, in the evening. So it, I guess what I've heard from a lot of people is, you know, that they want to make changes for themselves like because for, let's say for example a business has been closed or they've just been doing takeaway and they start to reopen they might just reopen um four days a week they might uh you know uh stop doing breakfast and just be doing lunch or just be doing lunch and dinner whatever it is like that, that they feel that they might be able to stop being all things to all people that they can actually be what they want to be uh, what would you say to people who are thinking along those lines Look, I, I, I'd never kind of dictate what anyone should do, but, um, gee, it, it's tough because you open a business and you might have an idea of exactly what you want to do and how you're going to do it, but ultimately the customers are the ones that define you. They're the ones that choose to engage and if you kind of deviate from that, you, you really do you do risk a lot and um, falling into that category <clears throat> is changing your business hours um, because loyalty only goes a certain way out in, in the market, I believe. Um, that's not to, you know, disparage anyone's reputation at all, but it, if you've been trading a certain amount of hours all the time and people you know, they, they start relying on that, then that change can be only small but it can have a seismic effect. Um, you know, it's one of those adages that old, you know, people in the hospitality trade from years ago used to say, don't close early. You know, if it says 11 on the door, stay open till 11 <clears throat> because you run the risk. And this is in a day when, you know, there wasn't, as much competition um but now if you if you were to close you know uh for two days a week and you've been open those seven days you're giving somebody an opportunity to go to another place potentially for two days and then they build up a relationship with them and then um their loyalties are um are tested yeah they want to come back the next day and have that roasty yeah, yeah exa exactly right. It's tricky. You know, it, it's – but it's a, a total um, – the, the opposite of the way that a lot of chefs want to work. You know, they want to be creative. They want to, um, you know, uh, be at – a lot of them want to be at the cutting edge of technique and, um, you know, the styles. It's, it's difficult to chop and change and if you're on to a good thing and people – come back to particularly older people they'll come back to um to what they know um and if you change that you run the risk of of um you know losing them as customers but then how do you not be on the treadmill how do you where's the like, how do you find that right balance i i think um it, look it's it's that you know sixty four thousand dollar question i think you have to reconcile, you know, what you're in the business for right right from the get-go. And uh, as I mentioned earlier to you, I've, you know, I've changed my, um, my goals and aspirations over the years because I've just learnt that there are, um, a, in my particular case, uh, there were uh, 
lessons that I've learned that made me reassess what I wanted to do to remain employable uh, and and to a degree relevant. And um, I think some people uh, are, are very bloody minded about what they want to do, and and good luck to them. But I, for a great deal of them, who who um, who who don't work out. There's only a small number of people that manage to do that successfully. Be bloody minded and just stick to one thing, and and they become very successful. There's a whole lot of people that that doesn't work for, and I think blaming a whole lot of um, factors is not. I think it's a bit disingenuous as to why perhaps it didn't work out for them. Right. So, that, you know, they could say, oh, customers won't pay an extra $2 a dish or everyone wants oat milk all of a sudden. So you could you could talk, they could blame a whole lot of factors, but you think in many cases the um, the major responsibility lies with them not being like flexible enough or not compromising enough or not being adaptable enough or not reading the market correctly. Yeah, all of those things, Danny. I think they're all... You know, they're all. It's it's a, you know, it. I won't say it's a science, but crikey, there are so many variables in this industry that, um, you know, I think just getting the fundamentals right are the things that um, at least give you a foundation of which to start observing other nuances in the industry. Like I don't know about you, but um, so many times I've been out and I'm invisible as a customer um and i've got to the stage and the age in my life where i don't point that out anymore to to people i just go well there's an opportunity for us to um to capitalize on that because they're not actually looking after people Mm. um something as basic something as basic as ice contact or just saying i'll be with you in a minute if people if you're busy you know you just acknowledge people um they're, they're just basics that I see overlooked um, a lot more now, primarily because there's a lot more places to go to. And you said before that you'd learnt lessons. I mean, is, is that the sort of stuff you're talking about or what are you talking about when you say you've learnt that? Oh, well, well, there's that. Um, when, look, when, when I had the, the cafe, um, I had a very strong ideal about what I wanted to do and um, I had to sort of curtail that because because we were living rurally. I don't know if you know, but Tassie's got a population of 500,000 people of which um, 200,000 are in the greater uh, Hobart area and the rest is kind of scattered all over the, the state. In, in Signet, we had a population of, I think, 1,300 people in the area and um, – the cafe that I had sat 80 inside and 40 outside, so it was quite a big space. Um, I had this idea that we are going to be breakfast and lunch and I only opened two dinners a week, Friday and Saturday. Um, and the first couple of weeks we opened, we were very busy at Friday and Saturday night and I was thinking this is great. Um, but then it started to slow down, so I had to – revisit dishes that perhaps I didn't really want to revisit um, from my wearing my chef's hat, but I put them on because I knew it will attract people again. You know, they'd say, oh, if you have that on again, I'll come in. So, you know, I big be- Was it – tell me what it was. <laughs> oh, okay. It was like it was a, it was a gnocchi that I made, a, a potato gnocchi, but I, I had really slow-cooked lamb, peas and carrots – that, you know, the lamb was local, the peas and carrots were local and I braised it down in a kind of a velouté and, you know, people couldn't get it down their necks quick enough. Um, so <laughs> it does I, sound I was, good. <laughs> yeah, look, it was. It was a nice dish um, and I enjoyed making it. But, you know, I, I also wanted to flex my chops, you know, as a chef. I got my own place, so I'm going to do this. and um, uh, But, you know, people... You know, when you have an empty night or a quiet night, um, you think, geez, you know, what what should I do? And that's when I started using social media a lot too. I um, started to put 
put it out there a bit of what we were doing without banging the drum too hard. I guess I tried to do it subtly by just posting an image or having, you know, a shot of us inside the kitchen working or something just to generate a bit of interest and let people kind of work it out for themselves, if that makes any sense. So they were kind of lessons that I – they were lessons that I learnt. Um, and also Friday, Saturday nights, we had this big wood oven that was kind of sitting dormant in the cafe and I – what I – when when it was quiet in winter I and we weren't doing that many people – Sometimes I'd close Friday and Saturday nights for, let's say, a period of three months and I would just stay back in the restaurant and make wood-fired pizzas just with myself on and, <clears throat> you know, I would end up um, – it would be end up being quite lucrative because, um, you know, it was the only offering that we had and, 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 and it taught me what I did then was – Instead of being open till 10 o'clock at night, you know, dealing with drunk people who want a pizza at the end of the night, what I used to do was make 50 bases, have them all ready, and from 5.30 I used to say to people, we'll take orders for pizzas. So I hate to use this word train the customer, but what I what I what what happened was people would ring up at 7 and say, can I order a pizza? I'd say, we sold out. And they'd say, oh, can you make more? And I go, yeah, I'll make more. No worries. I'd still make 50. And then the people that, um, that missed out last week would ring earlier. So it used to be that I would sell out <laughs> of all of these pizzas by about 7.30 every Friday and Saturday night. And I've made all my money and I'm closing the door and walking out the place. And the customers all knew that they had to get in early. It's so interesting, though, because on the one hand, you're saying that you bowed to customer demands and made the gnocchi, but on the other hand, you're restricting your offering severely and training the customers to do what you want. Yes, but this is this is the this is the point, and that if you've got and there's a whole lot of factors there. One, there was not many places open um, in Signet on those nights anyway, so we have a limited choice. Two, the product was good. You know, I have to say it was wood-fired pizza. All the toppings were good. Um, they were made, you know, well, which, which is, you know, pizza has come, you know, along a long uh, – pizza has come a, a long way, as we know, particularly in the big cities. But back then it, you know, it wasn't really. It was the usual horrible stuff that you get in some of those – places anyway um so there, there are a number of factors there but I guess the lesson that I learned was I was picking what I could um do and what I couldn't do and that was an evolve that was an evolving thing you know you can't be you just can't be static in this industry it's like when people back to your original question about people um wanting to reduce their hours um well if they reduce their hours then a lot of the time, or um, or if they want to, they don't want to work as much in their business. They have to pay somebody else to be there, and that where does that money come from? You know, they have to um, increase turnover to do that, or how how do they do that? And then if they're a name person that's associated with the brand or the business. A lot of customers will go there because they want to see that person on the floor or in the kitchen. And if they're not, if they're not, then for a lot of people, that's that's a bit disappointing because that's what they're paying for. A lot, a lot of people, you know, once you've been in the industry for a long time, you you, you get to the stage where you go, "Geez, I wouldn't mind stepping back and letting someone else have a crack." And you know, I want to take a bit of a, 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 a not a back seat, but I don't want to be on the firing line as much. And um, unfortunately, unless you have a business that's turning over huge amounts of money and not just that but making profit, which seems to be a dirty word in this industry, um, you can't really afford to step away because you're integral to keeping the wage costs down. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, you know. Well, let's talk about profit and the cost pressures associated with restaurants. Do you think 
there is money to be made? No, I, I think there is money to be made, but I think it's an incredibly difficult um, uh, situation to articulate to the general public um, the woes of a restaurateur, restaurateur because people see a busy restaurant and they go, oh, they're making a fortune. Um, there's still a number of people out there will, that will look at uh, a meal that's costing them, say, early thirty, but early 30s and go, oh, I can buy this at home, blah, blah, blah. Those people you're never going to convince that restaurants, um, you know, are, um, are um, run from very thin margins. Uh, and you'd never have that conversation with that person because it's a lose-lose. Um, but, yes, there is, there is money to be made. Um, there's money to be made in, uh, I think, there's two ways to make money. <clears throat> you either do very big scale um, or you do a tiny mum and dad show place where you cannot leave and you're tied to it. And that's why you have to decide whether you love it enough to do that or not. Basically, I, I just think it's getting, I just think it's getting harder and harder. Um, there aren't too many chefs um, out there that are still on the pans um, because it takes a lot out of you, you know. Um, and it's it's um, in in some ways a bit of a high wire act because. You can undo so much in such a short uh, – over, you know, a career, you can do a, undo it so quickly in a short amount of time if you're not always on the ball. You mean you can just burn through a lot of money in a short time? Oh, y- yes, and, and your reputation as well. Um, uh, running, running the business, um, we were – after five years, we were starting to make some money. And then we had a fire uh, and um, I had to borrow, you know, more money to get the, the business up and running again. And it became evident when we reopened uh, very quickly that we weren't do, doing anywhere near the kind of turnover that we were doing. Um, and, you know, we were out of action for nine months and that was enough time for people to change their habits. Lots of us, other businesses opened up. Um, we probably we we I took the opportunity to make the relaunch the restaurants look um, more in keeping with the delivery of the food and the service because back in the day the place was very sort of shabby chic. It was a bit op shop. The interior, the ambience was kind of patterns of stuff that I'd collected for a long time, and when we had the fire, all of that, all of that got burnt. So when people used to come into the cafe, they'd see all this daggy stuff, and they their expectations would be lowered. But then our service and our food would be of a notch higher than their expectations. So that really resonated. So I took the opportunity when we had the fire to recalibrate that and bring. Uh, contemporary country vibe to the look of the place. Well, when we opened, it was really divisive. Some some people absolutely hated it and weren't shy weren't shy in telling me. Um, and some people were saying, "Hooray! You know, it finally looks like a you know like what what they imagined." It could look, you know, it was sort of fulfilling its potential. But what I learned from that was, again, you know, there, there is when, you, when so many people are invested in your place, if you change something, you really do it at your peril, you know. Um, I, I think changing the interior, um, even though we had a fire and everything got burnt, I didn't want to turn it into a Bridie O'Reilly's version of the cafe, um, with all that, you know, ersatz sort of fake secondhand stuff, um, but but we pissed a lot of people off. So um, so anyway, in the end, we lost our uh, house because we had to sell the business. So we lost our farm and lost um, 
uh, had to virtually give the business away and moved to Hobart to start again from scratch. So Wow. So that was – That's terrible. Yeah, look, it was terrible but it's not the worst thing that can happen to you in your life. And um, I'm, I'm lucky that, you know, my wife has was working the whole time. She wasn't involved directly in the restaurant. Um, so, uh, I mean, by that I mean, you know, she – I was working in it. She wasn't. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, it was, was awful. So I've been through that crushing sort of feeling of losing everything um, that I loved through the restaurant. But, um, uh, you know, as I said, you just kind of got to dust yourself off basically. Can you see yourself owning a business again? Look, I'd love to, Danny. Um, I'm a romantic. And I love the whole culture of eating out and dining. I wonder, though, if my take on restaurants um, is of my generation and whether it's sort of, um, you know, or whether it's just me. I, I, I think, I think if, if I was to have a restaurant I'd have to, of my own, I'd have to really take a look in the mirror and think whether I was – what I would do would be relevant in today's market. Would it at the moment? I, I you know, I'm like a, I'm like a Ronan, a um, uh, a masterless samurai just plying my trade out there. <laughs> um, um, you know, which which is great because I've I've had some influence on a lot of large operations and 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 I enjoy that. Um, but if I had my own place. Um, I, yeah, I, I'd have to really question whether what I could offer would be relevant. Um, so that's a don't know whether I would have another rest. I don't think Kate would ever want, my wife would ever want us to have another restaurant because, you know, once bitten sort of thing. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I think there's opportunities now for a lot of chefs to work for somebody and the Maryvale group did this quite successfully to a degree, I think, by um, attracting some chefs that had their own restaurants and getting them to work for them because then the chefs could just concentrate on cooking and not running the business, which historically a lot of chefs, in fact the majority of them, haven't been really good at doing running businesses. They've been great at cooking not necessarily running businesses. I probably put myself in that class too, you know, um, not being as good at business as perhaps I should have been. So what's a good reason for a chef to open a restaurant? Ah, well, without, without the people that take a risk and without the people with big dreams and uh, without people that have a voice or a view that they want to do something, I think we they're the ones that inspire lots of us to kind of aim high um, and without those people doing that, um, I think you're at risk of having a, you know, a homogenous kind of landscape of, of places, which I know probably contradicts what I said earlier about giving the people what they want. Um, but, you know, it's complicated. It's, it's, it's not a finite science, this business. Um, you know, there are so many variables and so many intricacies that make places work and some places go into the stratosphere and others that don't. Um, so I, I would always encourage people to dream big, absolutely. I think sometimes as a diner you don't know what you want until someone gives it to you and there's plenty of times I've walked into a restaurant and, you know, in Melbourne and just thought, oh, you know, I thought Melbourne had had so much but it didn't have this and wow and, you know, I want to I come back ten times. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I personally am so grateful for those people going out on a limb but I want them to be um, able to... Uh, you know, sleep occasionally and I want them to make some money. So uh, 
it's just it is it's 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 definitely not an exact science um so tell me um steve like tell me what you love about cooking tell me why you still do it well you know i i i believe that um you know a lot of restaurants can fall into two camps they're either processing people or they're nurturing people and i've always been the type of person that um, I love cooking for my friends and family um, above anything else. But professionally, I'm also very lucky to, um, you know, after all this time, I still love cooking. I'm still learning all the time. Um, I'm still pushing myself to to learn and and to absorb things and ideas um, because I, I really love it's a way that I love to translate my love of my fellow human being by giving them sustenance that hopefully, um, you know, gives them a lot of pleasure to eat. Um, I'm a great believer in, um, you know, eating pleasurably. I just think it's one of the most fantastic things that we can do. And um, I suppose, in you know, uh, one, uh, you could call me an enabler. Um, I'm constantly giving people food that will make them fat, actually. And um, <laughs> everyone, everyone, uh, you know, I joke about it. I say, look, you know, um, here, have this. I, you know, I don't want them to be so fat that we have to cut them out of the side of a house or anything with a crane. But <laughs> I do, I do, I do want them to enjoy something, you know, like I, 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 I don't. I don't look at food as fuel at all. I look at it as, you know, like I, I still wake up in the morning and go, what am I going to have for dinner? Um, you know, I carry around condiments in, in my – I used to have a ute and I used to carry around condiments in the glove box of the ute because I like don't like to be, you know, uh, short and I always think shops are too stingy with their uh, condiments. Now I have a scooter and I've got I've got mustard and tomato sauce in the glove box of my scooter. Um, so I love it. I've down I've downsized <laughs> slightly. Um, if I get one of those electric skateboards, I might just have to wear a backpack with all the condiments in the back of it. But um, I'll leave that to, uh, to 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 until I get one. Yeah, that'll be an interesting modification. Maybe you can tape them to the deck or like <laughs> tape them to the trucks in between yeah. the wheels or something. That It must be a way. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think when food is made with the passion that you're talking about and with so much love and with so much belief in its ability to transform, then I think it's impossible for it not to be delicious and heartwarming and sustaining and, and a vehicle to to connect people to one another. So um, I'm definitely coming down for some of that good gear and um, please make me fat. Yeah, I will. Jeez, I've, I've just realised I've talked up such a big game now. I, I better bloody deliver when, when, when the pub opens. Yeah, geez. It's, okay, yeah. I, I, to be at a pub in Hobart eating your food, I'm going to hold that out in front of me as a little bit of a talisman. So Thank you so much for having a chat about it, Steve. It's wonderful to have your perspective on the industry. My pleasure, Danny. Thank you for letting me bend your ear and your listeners. <laughs> All right. We'll chat soon. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production. <laughs>